All right, welcome to Hoops tonight here at The Volume. Happy Monday, everybody. Hope all of you guys had an incredible weekend. Well, we got a jam-packed show for you today. We are finally turning our attention forward to the 2024-2025 NBA season. We're going to do a bunch of season previews on 20 different NBA teams as part of this series. We're going to do it power ranking style. And here at the start, in the beginning, we're going to go three teams per day. And then starting next week, we're going to slow way down and do one team per day as we get to our contender list. Today, we're going to be starting with the San Antonio Spurs, the Los Angeles Clippers, and the Miami Heat. You guys know the drill. Before we get started, subscribe to the Hoops Tonight YouTube channel so you don't miss any more of our videos. Follow me on Twitter at underscore JasonLT so you guys don't miss show announcements. Don't forget about our podcast feed, wherever you get your, uh, your podcast under Hoops Tonight. And then keep dropping mailbag questions in those YouTube comments so we can keep hitting them throughout the rest of the year. And then one last note before we get started, I'm currently in the process of moving my studio to a different room in the house. So, uh, and we're also going to do some updates, especially to the Two Sons podcast studio that I do with my uh, with my buddy Luke that's going to be behind this. Um, but we're doing a bunch of new furniture and a bunch of new stuff. So it's just going to be a little bit construction zony over the course of the next couple of weeks. So bear with me, but uh, it'll be nice to have some new digs for this season. It's also a little echoey in here, so uh, I'm sorry about that, but we're going to get uh, some acoustic foam and stuff in here that should make that better in the long run. So as we turn our attention towards next season, I want to talk about a couple of different things. We're going to cover 20 teams in a series in three different tiers. And the way I have these tiers listed out are the first tier that we're going to go through. Those are the nine teams that we're going to hit this week. Those are good teams that need more firepower to truly contend for a title. So these are teams that have solid foundations, they have good players, but they just don't quite have enough juice to really realistically feel like they can win four playoff series. These are trade candidates. These are teams where we can see if something might change over the course of the season, but at this point I view them as long shots to win the title. So we're going to start in that tier. Our next tier, which we're going to start next week, is going to be that if things go right contenders. These are teams that have enough talent to compete for a title, but they have significant holes or significant question marks that make it almost as likely that they would lose in the first round as they would make a deep playoff run. So these are teams that certainly have that upside, but the question marks are pretty substantial. I have seven of these teams. We're going to hit them one at a time starting next week. And then after we get through those seven teams, we're going to get to our bona fide top tier championship contenders. These are teams with a ton of talent, very little in the way of holes and weaknesses. Anything less than a conference finals appearances uh, and a, a conference finals appearance for these teams would be deemed a massive failure. And I have four teams in that tier to start this year. You guys know the drill but during the season, like these, all these teams can jockey up and down based on how they're playing. I will add teams or remove teams from the top tier championship contenders or from the if things go right tier based on how things go. We're going to do power rankings probably on Fridays, similar to what we did last year. But this is just kind of an initial baseline before we see any of these team pl uh, d these teams play. And there's likely to be lots of movement because, as you guys know, once the teams actually start playing, we tend to learn a lot more than we can just from simple roster uh, uh, roster changes. As far as the tiers go, this first group, so this uh, these first nine teams that I'm hitting this week on Monday, Wednesday, Friday, we're going to be hitting them three teams at a time. So we won't go as far into depth with them as we do with the top 11, uh, but we still will talk about their seasons, their changes that they made to the roster, and just some expectations for them this year. And then, uh, as I mentioned, we're these, these next two weeks, we're going to stay on our summer schedule of going three times a week. So we'll go Monday, Wednesday, Friday, we'll run breakout clips on the other days. But as soon as we start getting real basketball, which is October 4th, that following Monday, we're going to shift back to going five times a week. And you guys can count on getting a good mix of these kind of season previews, as well as preseason game reactions before we head into the actual season. So one last thing before we get into the teams. What are we looking for in a basketball team's ability to contend? I want to talk a little bit from the outside looking in at the entire league on just certain things that we talk about. These are going to be a lot of different uh, concepts that I've talked 
extensively on the show before. We talked about it in our, like, what did we learn after the NBA Finals? We talk about it through the year. These are pretty consistent basketball ideologies that I have that I believe matter at the NBA level. And so I have five things that I'm looking at with these teams as I uh, start to evaluate them heading into the season. Number one, what's your overall depth of talent? It's an 82-game regular season. You might have a key starter miss a month or two months. You might have two starters miss time. You could have a star miss a substantial amount of time. The overall amount of talent you have on your roster is what matters within the 82-game season in terms of your ability to weather guys being in and out of the lineup. If you've got a core seven, that's awesome. And you feel really good about your playoff chances if you can get there healthy, but your back end of your roster isn't very good then you could run into issues where you're going into uh, a couple of weeks of hoops where you got four good players on your team and a bunch of guys that are kind of playing outside of what their pay grade is, right? And you could have issues. So depth of talent is something that we're going to be factoring in. Two, advantage creation. Do you have high-level offensive players that can create advantages? The simple kind of uh, uh, you know metaphor I use to, to break this down is if we were playing king of the court, And I had, uh, let's just say, five average high school players playing king of the court. And I had uh, you standing as the defender locked in right on the guy to start the possession. They are going to score at a certain rate. But if I move that defender to the midline and I make him close out before that offensive player goes to try to do something, the score rate is going to skyrocket at the high school level. But even at the pro level, it's going to go up substantially. Guys are converting spot-up possessions at substantially higher rates against a closeout than guys are converting in ISO situations or even lesser quality spot-up possessions where the defender doesn't get sucked as far into help, right? So having high-level offensive players, your star power on offense, and their ability to consistently generate advantages makes for easier basketball for your role players. There are a lot of NBA players that can play well with an advantage, but that can struggle when that advantage isn't there. And so that's a very important piece. Thirdly, aggregate offensive skill. When you have that advantage, and now we're playing drive and kick basketball, do you have a group that can consistently pay it off? The two kind of like bookends of this example that I would give you guys are take a look at like Boston and how anytime Jason Tatum would run a ghost screen with Derek White and get a little bit of an advantage for him or beat Luka Doncic off the dribble and make that first kickout pass, it's just beautiful drive and kick basketball because they have so much ball handling, shooting, and passing ability on the floor, right? Juxtapose that with the Minnesota Timberwolves, who are consistently playing a lot of guys that struggle to dribble, shoot, and pass, guys like Rudy Gobert, J.D. McDaniels, Nikhil Alexander-Walker, Kyle Anderson. All of a sudden, it doesn't matter that Anthony Edwards is getting double teamed almost every time he touches the ball because they can't capitalize on it on the weak side. And that was a Minnesota Timberwolves offense that struggled all year long and then struggled mightily when they ran into a tough matchup in the Western Conference Finals, right? So that aggregate offensive skill, the totality of your team's ability to capitalize on advantages is something that I'm going to be looking very closely at. Four, What's your strong base defensive scheme? Like, what is the thing that you count on over the course of 82 games to run defensively? And that's going to work against the majority of the opponents that you run. Like, do you have a good base drop coverage scheme? Do you have a good base high drop scheme? Do you have a good base, you know, switching scheme that you use defensively? What's your, like, base defensive scheme? Is it something that's going to work reasonably well enough over the 82 games? And then lastly... Defensive versatility. How vulnerable are you to certain types of offensive players? Can you defend certain ways or different ways? Like if you run into a specific matchup where it's really quick guards that space you out, and but you don't have athletic guards, and so you can't contain the basketball, and so you're dead to rights in rotation all day. That was an issue that the Lakers had with the Sacramento Kings last year, right? 
uh, the Oklahoma City Thunder and how they struggled against physical front lines, right? Like there are matchup things, matchup weaknesses that certain defenses can have. And if you don't have another look that you can go to to just make it so that there are less of those holes that could potentially get you beat, that's something that can make you a stronger team. So again, overall depth of talent in order to weather the 82, advantage creation to give your lesser players easier opportunities, aggregate offensive skill, how good are you at capitalizing on those opportunities, what's your base defensive scheme, and do you have the ability to tweak things defensively as you run into tougher matchups down the line in the playoffs. So those are the main kind of concepts that I'm going to be looking at. Again, we're going to be hitting three teams today, three on Wednesday, three on Friday, and then we'll hit into our top 11 contenders one at a time starting next Monday. So first and foremost, number 20, the San Antonio Spurs. Let's take a quick look at their offseason. They lost Dominique Barlow, Devontae Graham, and Chetty Osman. They added Harrison Barnes, BJ Boston from the Clippers, Malachi Flynn, Chris Paul, from the Golden State Warriors, and then in the draft, Stefan Castle, a really interesting big guard out of UConn. We covered him a lot during the draft, so you guys can go further back on our video uh, feed to find some uh, some more content surrounding Stefan Castle. Their depth chart going into the season at guard, Chris Paul, Devin Vassell, Stefan Castle, Trey Jones, Malachi Branham. Forwards, Keldon Johnson, Harrison Barnes, Jeremy Sohan, Julian Champagne, and Sandro, I'm, I'm going to butcher this, so please bear with me, Mamukelashvili, okay? And then at center, Victor Wembenyama, Zach Collins, and Charles Bassey. As far as their starters, my guess is they'll start Chris Paul and Devin Vassell together in the backcourt. And then I think you'll see Harrison Barnes and Jeremy Sohan at the three and four with Victor Wembenyama at the five. I think that's a pretty straightforward starting group with the guys that they have. I think they view Keldon Johnson more as a bench weapon at this point. Um, let's talk a little bit about what they do on the defensive end, and then we'll talk about the offense. So on the defensive end, they were pretty standard a uh, uh, drop coverage team at the tail end of the year when uh, Mamu Kelashvili was playing more, they were running some drop with him as well. They were actually dropping with both him and Wemby, but with Harrison Barnes and Jeremy Sohan, my guess is what they'll do is they'll switch two through four, any actions that involve those three players, but then they'll hedge with CP three and any sort of guard screens where the guard is setting the screen. And then they'll drop with Victor Wembenyama. And like, even with, CP3 and Wemby in actions like that's as good a drop coverage big you can partner with CP3 to make it easier on him he doesn't need to be completely attached all the time Wemby's so good at bothering ball handlers in ball screens I think that's kind of like a nice partnership there to make an achievable defensive role for Chris Paul they ran a little bit of zone last year they were 12th in zone frequency they ran 229 possessions I was middle of the pack the numbers are interesting because they finished 21st in defense with a 115.6 defensive rating, but they were 111.2 when Wemby was on the floor, which is really good. So like for perspective, the Miami Heat, who we're also going to talk about today, they were fifth in defense last year at a 111.5 defensive rating. So Wemby at 111.2 when he was on the floor basically was an elite defense. He just only played 29 minutes and they just got absolutely thrashed every time he was off the floor. So that's why their defensive rating wasn't very good. My guess is Victor's minutes will go up this year. Uh, he played, uh, what, 29 something last year. My guess is he's up around 33 minutes per game this year. With Chris Paul and Harrison Barnes, just two savvy veterans who've been in the league for a long time, I think that'll help with consistency of effort and communication on the defensive end. So I think it's reasonable to think that the Spurs could move into that like 15 range defensively, maybe as high as 10. Uh, but in that 10 to 15 range, I think is an achievable goal for them defensively this year. Now, the offensive side of the floor is where things I think are going to shift in a big way for the Spurs. Like, Adding CP3 just fundamentally alters their style, right? Because last year, this was a heavy ball and player movement team. They were seventh in passes made per game. They were second in assists per game. A lot of like standard five out stuff. A lot of Victor Weminyama kind of operating as the, at the elbow, running dribble handoffs, uh, looking to turn and score. It was much more equal opportunity on offense. And they also ran in transition a ton. They ran in transition a ton, a lot of ball and player movement, not as much pick and roll, right? They were 16th in pick and roll frequency, second in transition frequency. I expect those numbers to change with Chris Paul. I expect the pace of play to drop and them to be a little bit more methodical, and I expect them to be a higher frequency pick and roll team. 
And one, one of the main things that I'm looking for, I want to see Victor Wembanyama give more more opportunities to score on the roll rather than constantly having to operate with the ball in his hands. And the guy that I look at here, uh, guys that I look at here as examples are guys like Anthony Davis and Nikola Jokic. So like, as we know, Nikola Jokic is this devastating post-up weapon, this devastating five-out fulcrum on offense, right? Anthony Davis, less so in those regards, but similar in the sense that he's a screening fulcrum for the Lakers and their guards, but he's also a guy that you can run through the post. He had his best postseason, a post-up season of his career, right? But what, what drives a lot of the success for both Jokic and Anthony Davis as offensive players is they can catch in the pocket around 10 to 15 feet from good passers that are setting them up and those the players who have the ball, in this case, Austin Reeves and D'Lo or LeBron for the Lakers or uh, you know Jamal Murray for, for the Nuggets, they're, those offensive players are high-powered enough that they pull things towards them enough that the pocket is nice and open there for Jokic and AD to get a lot of these like easy floaters and quick catch, like uh, maybe an iso move, but like a quick iso move when the defender who's the screen defender is out of position rather than squared up with them, right? Kind of a similar context to what we were talking about earlier when we were talking about King of the Court, right? And so Jokic and AD supplement their offense with all these really high-quality roll touches. Uh, Victor Wembanyama last year was 16th in roll volume. So there were 15 bigs who got more opportunities to score on the roll. He only had 176 possessions all year. It's a, a, like a little over two a game. So like I want to, I just want to see Victor get more of those opportunities. Like Rudy Gobert had more catches and opportunities to score on the roll than Victor Wembanyama did last year. I'd like to see that number go from that 176 closer to 250, maybe even 300 for Wemby. That I think is something that CP3 can help him with. I just want to supplement again, like we know what Wemby's upside is, but the more we can kind of like get him easier opportunities to kind of supplement his offense, that's what can lead to some really high efficiency and volume scoring seasons. I think floor spacing is going to be a big thing for this team. And I think both Chris Paul and Harrison Barnes help in a big way there. So uh, as a team, the Spurs were 27th. So fourth worst in the league, converting spot-up possessions at 0.98 points per possession. Harrison Barnes was a 70th percentile spot-up guy last year at 1.10 points per possession. Chris Paul was an 86th percentile spot-up guy at 1.18 points per spot-up possession. Both of them shot over 45% field goal percentage on unguarded catch-and-shoot jump shots. So you just have a much higher level set of off-ball offensive players, too, in situations where Wemby's operating with the Rock. So, in summary, I think it's a substantial increase in shooting and ball handling, which obviously were two major weaknesses last year. Obviously, Wemby has another year of experience. We saw how well he played at the tail end of the year, which I'll, I'll give you guys that stat that I gave you the other day again here in a minute. But then he even had an impressive competitive run with FIBA so at the Olympics. So here's one last crazy stat to kind of set the stage for the Spurs this season. In the final 45 games of the year last year, which again, that's more than half the year, the Spurs were plus 28 when Victor Wemby, Weminyama was on the floor and they were minus 202 with him off. That's raw, pro, raw plus minus. So like they were positive for more than half the season with, Vink, with Victor Weminyama on the floor. And then they were massively negative. And that was with a really weak roster. You're giving him a lot of uh, veteran kind of like help this season. Obviously, he's a better player now than he was last year. So a lot a lot to be really optimistic about as a Spurs fan. Now, as we know, there's 13 teams trying to win in the Western Conference. Teams like Houston, they're trying to win. Teams like uh, uh, Memphis, they're going to be right back in the mix. They weren't in the mix last year. San Antonio is trying to win. And so will they get into the play-in? We'll see. They'll be fighting in that range. My guess is they'll be in that 8 to 12 range. And whether or not they actually get in is going to come down to just how dominant Victor Wembanyama is in his second season. TD Tutty taking it to the house. In for six. Whatever you call a touchdown, one thing is for sure. Touchdowns matter more at DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports betting partner of the NFL. On the ground, in the air, from the special teams or defense, we don't care how they score them. We want to bet on touchdowns. And DraftKings Sportsbook is the number one place to bet touchdowns. Ready to place your first NFL bet? 
Try betting on something simple, like a player to score a touchdown. Go to the DraftKings Sportsbook app and make your bet today. You can also bet on who's going to win the Super Bowl right now. DraftKings has the Kansas City Chiefs as the favorite at plus 500, followed by the San Francisco 49ers at plus 600. Ready to do a touchdown dance of your own? New DraftKings customers bet $5 to get $250 in bonus bets instantly and get one month of NFL Plus Premium. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app and use code HOOPS. That's H-O-O-P-S. That's code HOOPS for new customers to get $250 in bonus bets when you bet just 5 bucks and get one month of NFL Plus Premium only on DraftKings. The crown is yours. All right, number 19, the Los Angeles Clippers. Quick recap of their offseason. They lost BJ Boston, Musa Diabate, Paul George, Mason Plumley, Daniel Tice, and Russell Westbrook. They added Mo Bamba. He's a stretch five, really good above the break shooter, but kind of a mixed bag everywhere else. Uh, Nick Batum was one of my favorite three and D guys in the leagues. Really good mobility and length to defend guards. Chris Dunn, one of the best guard defenders in the league. Derek Jones, a guy who uh, just had a phenomenal postseason run as a perimeter defender. You can kind of pick up the theme here. A lot of good perimeter defenders in uh, uh, Los Angeles playing for the Clippers. We're going to get more into that in a minute. And then Kevin Porter Jr., although the league is apparently restarting an investigation into his uh, his domestic violence issue, so we'll see if he actually ends up playing, but he's on the roster as well. Their depth chart going into next year, uh, James Harden, Norman Powell, Terrence Mann, Bones Highland, Chris Dunn, Josh Primo, and Kevin Porter Jr. at guard. At forward, Kawhi Leonard, P.J. Tucker, Derek Jones Jr., Nick Batum, um, Amir Coffey and Kobe Brown. And then at center of Ika Zubac, Kai Jones and Mo Bama. My guess is that their starting lineup is almost certainly going to include James Harden, Terrence Mann, Kawhi Leonard, and Ika Zubac. It really just comes down to who you're going to play at the three. And I, th- I look at two options there, either Nick Batum or Derek Jones. Uh, Derek Jones, I think, is a little bit better and more versatile defensively. I think Nick Batum is a better shooter and closeout attacker. So it's going to really just be about You know, if Kawhi Leonard's just really, really damn healthy and Terrence Mann is kicking ass at the point of attack, maybe Ty Lue leans more towards shooting and closeout attacking at that position. But if they're struggling on defense or if they want to keep Kawhi off ball as much as possible to save his legs, maybe they end up going with Derrick Jones. Uh, We also never know with this kind of thing how much uh, agent relationship played a role in terms of the contract. So it's very possible that there was a promise to play like a, like Derek Jones uh, uh, under the impression he's supposed to start per kind of the negotiation surrounding his contract. So we'll see. But my guess is it'll be Batum or Derek Jones playing at the three. We know on defense uh, they will run drop coverage with Zubac, but they, their preferred scheme under Ty Lue is they want to switch, especially uh, at late game situations. That's what they just kind of go to as their as their kind of foundation defensively. They're really, really athletic on the perimeter, not at the forward position, like the big forwards, but like guys who are going to be guarding opposing twos and threes. You're not going to find many better defensive cores than what the Clippers have. Terrence Mann, really good. Chris Dunn, really good. Derek Jones, really good. Nick Batum, really good. They're going to get after the basketball. They're going to defend well at the point of attack. And that, I think, is going to allow them to be competitive over the course of the regular season. And that really is my main takeaway on the Clippers heading into this year. <clears throat> I think this is going to be a really good regular season team. They're younger and more athletic than you'd think. Like their shot creators are older. Like James Harden's older. Obviously Kawhi Leonard's older. Uh, Norman Powell as, a, as like a closeout attacker shooter. He's older. He's 31 now. Uh, PJ Tucker's obviously really old, but all the other guy, all the other role players are relatively young. You know, like there's a lot of guys in their mid to late twenties that are really good athletes on this roster. And when you combine that with, I still think, you know, we, we have our question marks surrounding Kawhi and James Harden in the playoffs, right? Like will James Harden be able to get separation and, and get to his, his shot against an elite defense for multiple rounds. Like we know how that story goes. Will Kawhi Leonard's knee hold up? We know how that story goes. However, James Harden is still one of the best regular season offensive engines in the league. He averaged 17 points, five rebounds and nine assists a game last year. You know how many players averaged at least 16 points and eight assists in the entire NBA last year? 10, 10 guys. And Harden was one of them while playing alongside two other ball dominant stars. Right? So like, Really impressive season there. His shot creation numbers were incredible. He was an 87th percentile pick and roll player. 
86th percentile ISO player, both right around 1.1 points per possession, which is really good. So like I can count on James Harden as long as he's healthy and on the floor to be a really good regular season shot creator. That's going to help you set a high floor for the offensive end of the floor, right? Kawhi Leonard, we know he has his health issues, but aside from the year he missed the entire season, he plays 50 games at least. Like, you're probably going to get 50 games from Kawhi at about near MVP level, right? So, like, with those two guys kind of raising the offensive floor and just all of the quick, feisty perimeter defenders that they have, I, that, I think that's just going to lead to a high regular season output. And so, again, whatever whatever your issues are for uh, with this team in the postseason, they, they're they going to be a good regular season team, in my opinion. They have depth of talent, like we talked about. They've got shot creation. As far as aggregate offensive skill, that other uh, these pieces that we talked about at the beginning of the show, without Paul George, I'm a little worried about their shooting. But not so much with their like main players. It's more of a depth thing. I think like if guys miss time in the regular season, they could be a little bit light on shooting. But then there's also multiple ways to provide spacing. Like you can you can provide spacing driving closeouts too. Derek Jones Jr. last year had a season where the shooting was somewhat inconsistent, but he was really good at like driving the slot. So like he'd catch on the wing. And again, I, this there are a lot of like these baked in driving lanes in basketball, right? Like if you're on the left wing and the ball's on the right wing and your defender's kind of towards the midline and James Harden just throws a swing pass to Derrick Jones and he immediately catches and rips to the left, there's a baked in driving lane there because his defender is sitting on his right shoulder, like in the lane and closing out that way. And so Derrick Jones provided spacing that way. So like, I'm not super worried about it, but I wouldn't say it's a strength on this team. Um, they have a strong base defensive scheme, uh, and the one the one knock I really have on them is their defensive versatility. This has been a consistent issue for the Clippers over the years. Uh, whenever they do end up going switching, teams start to hunt their s- centers. When they start to go small, they're not nearly big enough in terms of the overall aggregate uh, size of their lineup. So like, I'm not a big fan of the defensive versatility of this unit, but that's more of a playoff issue anyway. So not a perfect team by any stretch. Um, but like without Paul George, there's not really a championship ceiling there, but I think they have a really strong regular season foundation. And I actually think they have a solid chance, even as a team that doesn't really have a chance to win the title. I think they have a solid chance to like stay out of the play in. Like if you told me the Clippers finished with the five seed this year, I would not be shocked just with the sheer amount of regular season kind of engine type of talent that they have. All right. Last team for today. Number 18, the Miami Heat, a team that uh, is more or less the same type of team they've been for the last few years, but we're going to talk about them a little bit. Offseason recap, they lost Caleb Martin. They lost Patty Mills, Orlando Robinson, and DeLon Wright. They added Alec Burks, who just came off of a nice little bench run uh, with the New York Knicks in the postseason. Josh Christopher, Kalel Ware, a super athletic stretch five uh, out of Indiana. And then I, uh, just even though these guys may not play a lot this year, I want to shout out a couple of Arizona guys. I'm a Tucson guy. So Pella Larson and Kashad Johnson, uh, uh, two guys I really liked watching with Arizona, are uh, on the team, at least for training camp. Depth chart at guard, Tyler Harrow, Terry Rozier, Josh Richardson, Alec Burks, Pella Larson. At forward, Jimmy Butler, Duncan Robinson, Haywood Highsmith, Jaime Jaquez Jr. Shout out Jaime. We did that interview earlier this summer. Nikola Jovic, Keisha Johnson, Bam out of biome, Kevin Love, Kellel Ware, and Thomas Bryant are your centers. So uh, hard to know what to make of this team after last year. On the one hand, Jimmy gets hurt, right? So you can't take too much from the playoff run. And they stole a game in Boston, classic Miami Heat fashion, right? Just grind it out. But on the other hand, according to Cleaning the Glass, their core four guys, Terry Rozier, Tyler Harrow, Jimmy Butler, and Bam out of bio, they played together 241 possessions last year is roughly two and a half games, two games ish in 241 possessions. They got outscored by 2.1 points per 100 possessions, according to uh, cleaning the glass. That's bad on both ends. If you remove Terry Rozier from the equation, because he obviously came at a trade deadline deal, the Terry, uh, the uh, Tyler Harrow, Jimmy Butler, Bam at a bio trio played 993 possessions and they were just plus 3.8 net per 100 possessions, which is fine, but it's not in the same stratosphere as the other cores around the conference. Like the Knicks, Jalen Brunson, Isaiah Hartenstein, OG Ananobi, 879 possessions plus 27 
net, plus 27 points per 100 possessions. The Celtics, Jalen Brown, Jason Tatum, Derek White, 2,710 possessions, plus nine points per 100 possessions net. That's really, really good. The Bucks, Giannis, Dame, Chris Middleton, 1,600 possessions, plus 16 net. So like the top teams in the conference, when they have their main guys on the floor, they kick ass. The Miami Heat don't. Just another random middle of the uh, pack Eastern Conference team like the Cleveland Cavaliers. Donovan Mitchell, Darius Garland, and Jared Allen, 1,190 possessions plus 4.1 net per 100 possessions. So like even the Cavs, who are just kind of a random middle of the pack standard team in the Eastern Conference, they don't even, uh, the, the, the Miami Heat can't even with their core match that level of production, which is majorly concerning, right? Jimmy just wasn't as good as he was last year. Uh, Bam does continue to make small strides as an offensive player, but he's still nowhere near as as good as uh, as he needs to be to be a real driver of high-level offense, right? Tyler Harrow is a pull-up jump shooter who isn't particularly good at hitting pull-up jump shots. He shot below 40% on him last year, got just 0.98 points per shot. Like, if you're a professional pull-up jump shooter, you need to be over a point per shot. Tyler Harrow's not there. So the core just isn't as effective as it used to be. A little bit of a decline from Jimmy. The other guy's not really having enough. We'll see what a full training camp with Terry Rozier can kind of do for them. Maybe it loosens things up for them on the offensive end. And I'm excited to see Bam maybe with some more two big looks. If Kellel Ware and his ability to shoot and protect the rim kind of translate, you could see a a version of the two of them playing together. We saw what that looks like, a a much crazier version of it alongside Anthony Davis with Team USA, right? But like, we'll get, I'm excited. There's some things that I'm really looking forward to seeing with Miami, but nothing that really drives for me a, a change in opinion of what this team is capable of. I wonder if they're a, a candidate for an aggressive and risky deal, like kind of a talent ad type of deal. So like if someone like Zach Levine or Brandon Ingram or Julius Randle got off to a good start, I wouldn't be surprised if the Heat tried to make some sort of aggressive move like that. Uh, but there's not really much to get into with Miami. They're more or less the same basketball team that they've been for a few years now. Uh, the one real piece of optimism, like if I was trying to like talk myself into a more aggressive Miami take, What I'd say is last year they were fifth in defense, and now you're getting a full training camp to try to incorporate Terry Rozier, which will hopefully add more offensive upside. And then the last piece of optimism is Jimmy Butler. He had a bad year last year. Down the board, his numbers were down. Um, He got hurt, missed the playoffs, and he's also more or less in a contract year, right? So like maybe you just get this big, like, fuck you, bounce back season from Jimmy Butler, and maybe that could turn things around. But it's just it's it's tough. And the other thing, the other thing is, is the rest of the East is rapidly improving, right? Like the Magic will be better this year than they were last year. The Pacers will be better this year than they were last year. The 76ers will be better this year than they were last year. So honestly, the Miami Heat look like a play-in team to me again. Uh, but obviously, they have the upside of a potential trade if they decide to get aggressive at some point during the season. But right, right now, I have them at 18 in my power rankings. All right, guys, that is all I have for day one. We'll be back on Wednesday with three more teams. As always, I sincerely appreciate you guys for supporting the show, and I'll see you guys then.